Hello and welcome back to our lecture. Now today we have two chapters, chapters 10 and 11. There's a lot of information in here and please don't get overwhelmed. Um, I'm going to go more in depth into the things that we are going to use and less in depth into those that we are not. So if it looks like I'm kind of glossing over stuff, I apologize. Um, but really, you know, I want to make sure you guys get the basic understanding. Um, going through the assignments from last lecture, everything looked really good except um, we have to use functions and I think that was part of the assignment that was missed and we've got to use that um, create a function in order to use it. It looked like everyone had the same the, the same steps, the steps were correct, but the whole point was to put it into a function so that we could reuse it later. So um, I gave most people um, feedback on their individual assignments and then I did go ahead and post a link to the quote unquote answer key on how I did it. Um, which of course is not the only way to do it, um, up in the announcements of the course. So take a minute, look at the code that I put up there and kind of absorb it and just see, you know, how you had a different way of thinking than what I did. Anyway, again, if you have any questions, please let me know. So let's get started with today. So first we're going to start out with sam um, chapter 10, which we're going to go into sampling. It's pretty straightforward. Again, we're going to talk about what a sample is, what populations are, um, and then we're going to get into chapter 11. Now, chapter 11 is a little bit more robust than 10. 11, we're going to talk about accessing data, which sounds simple enough, but we're going to look at several different, and when several, I mean a lot, of different ways to access different forms of data, okay? That's why I don't want you to get overwhelmed. Chapter 10, I'm not worried about you guys with chapter 10. Chapter 11, I'm going to try to point out the things that are going to be more important um, when completing assignments and the labs and things that are more for just informational purposes, okay? There is also a lot more in chapter 11 in the book. I didn't really see, you know, a whole lot, especially with our seven-week setup, to go too in-depth into that. Um, but it is there for you to read and to go through. So let's get started with chapter 10 and we're going to talk about sampling. First part of today's lecture, we're going to investigate how to create and interpret sampling distributions, how to use R to repeat sampling. We're going to discuss the effects of randomness when one samples a population and the law of large numbers and the central limit theorem. Okay, when we talk about that, it's going to be like a short and sweet, like this is what it is. We're not getting really into theory, okay? Then finally, we're going to use some additional R functions, and we're going to look at them a little bit closer. And it's going to be the quantile replicate uh, sample uh, and summary, most likely. First, we need to know how to draw a random sample from a data set. So a sample is going to be just a random collection of a population. Now, when I'm saying population here, I'm talking about the entirety of the data available and not the population of what is out there in the world available, okay? I'm talking about I have a data set with millions of rows. I'm going to take a sample of a couple hundred, okay? We use the term sampling as a verb to repeatedly draw items to create that subset from a population. The data result of that sampling is called the sample distribution, okay? Luckily for us, R has a function called sample, and it's going to draw that random sample from a data set with just a single statement call, so it's going to be very easy. You create a sample by using the keyword sample with three different arguments. The first argument is the data source. And that is going to be your full population of data. So you can see in the example here, we're sending it an entire column from that U.S. state population census that we've been working on for the past couple lectures. The second argument is going to be the sample size. So in this example, I tell you I want eight, okay? It's going to draw eight data values. When you look at the one on the bottom over here and you say size, and size equals 16. That means it's going to pull 16 values, okay? Lastly, there is an argument, it's called replace. Um, 
typically for what we're gonna we're not getting into too in depth into what replaces because it's it's beyond the scope of this course so we're just gonna say replace equals true um, it's gonna indicate a sampling style that is the most common sampling style out there so therefore we should be good to go you can nest your sample within other functions so if you would like to find the mean of a sample like we did down here you can say um, mean and then send it sample and the sample function call would be exactly you know as if you were doing a sample function call um, you know just by its own now one thing you do have to remember is that no two times you call sample are you going to get exactly the same data so each time you call sample it is going to give you a, a random set of data okay so it you really cannot replicate it now because of that the output it's probably not going to be exact and totally accurate okay you know we all know a sample is going to rarely you know produce the exact numbers of the full population but as going back to a couple lectures ago we need to make sure we get a sample that is sufficient enough to model the full population if we need to repeat a sample okay multiple times sometimes we may even want to do it hundreds of times thousands of times who knows okay there is a replicate function in r the first argument is going to be the number of times that you want to replicate so in this example we have four we're going to replicate it four times then you send it the data okay so this this next one here is the data so what i'm doing here is i want to create four sample sets of the mean samples okay so i'm creating a sample of the samples okay if that, if that makes sense and then finally we tell our um, the simplify equals true and what that's going to do is it's going to return a simple vector okay so you know what we're going to look at here soon is we're going let's look at um we're going to get the mean of the replication of the mean okay we're going to nest everything together but let's do it in um like sample sets of a four thousand as opposed to four okay what it's going to do is it's going to calculate the mean for each sample and then it calculates the mean of that list of means so here we go i've got um some nested commands up here and so i've got the mean i've replicated a sample four thousand times of the mean okay um and then what i did is i sent it to a histogram so let's look at what it looks like over here so this histogram is going to be a complete listing of the 4,000 means as frequencies right so the tallest most frequent range is near the true mean of the full data set that we generated last lecture okay so you can generate this and again you don't have to nest you can assign variables either way is perfectly fine but you can nest the replicate mean inside the histogram and that will output what you see on that right hand side now one thing i do want you to take a quick note of is the shape of that histogram we have here our little you know our nice little bell curve okay that leads us into the law of large numbers and central limit theorem the law of large numbers says that if you run a statistical process on a large number of times it will converge on a stable result okay so the larger your sample size the more stable now the central limit theorem on the other hand it, it is based off the law of large numbers but it also explains how sampling distribution is going to take on that bell-shaped curve and it is going to get close to that actual mean we saw that in that histogram that i just pointed out it gets closer faster with larger samples okay for smaller samples you need to run more repeats okay so hopefully that makes sense we saw both of these in that previous example right but we also did 4,000 replicates of samples okay we did see that it had that bell sharp bell sharp bell shaped curve as well as a stable mean result let's go back into the code and look at some functions where we can look at the quantile replicate sample and summary first let's start by saving one distribution of sample means um, here we're doing 10,000 of them we're going to store it 
using the assignment operator and the name sample means. Sample means assignment operator, and here's my replicate statement. Okay, next we're gonna run a summary on what that gave us, okay? What you're gonna see here is the summary of the replicate output. Okay, it's gonna give you a minimum, it's gonna give you a maximum, it is going to give you the mean and median, which the median, by the way, happens to be the second quartile, and then the first and third, okay? Just as a reminder, the first quartile divides the first quarter of cases from the other three quarters, okay? There is, though, a more flexible way of getting that same information, especially with the quartile functions. You can run the quartile um, function and send it your sample and then send it the probabilities that you would like to see, and it will send back the three. And you could see that it's, you know, they're very similar to what is up there, what is up there. So let's take a quick moment and let's do a hands-on example comparing two different samples. So I did create this function last time. So we're going to go ahead and use it and uh, get our data imported so we can kind of keep going. So, so I want to, first I want to do, I want to run all of that. And I have access to those in there. Then I'm going to say US state pops. Uh, read census. Okay. Now it's giving me the data up here. Now I have access to everything. It's all clean. It's all ready to go. It's doing all those steps we did before. And all I had to do was call this one function. So that's where the functions are a little bit helpful for you. Um, okay. Let's create that sample means. Okay, we're gonna use that replicate. Okay, let's give it the 10,000. We wanna say mean of the sample, US state pops, dollar sign, April census, comma size equals five, replace true all caps, go outside two, and then simplify equals true. Okay, you can see here now we've got a new variable access to us called sample means. Okay, let's um, do some double checks. So let's see the length of sample means. Okay, there's my 10,000. So it does have the 10,000. Now, let's look at the mean. Okay, there's our mean. That should be pretty close to our population. Um, but remember, we've got a population of like 6 million here. We only took 10,000. Um, let's look at that summary that we we talked about. Okay, there's my minimum, my maximum, my first, second, third, medium, and mean. Okay, so that gives some of the bit the big information that we um, talked about prior. So let's create now a mystery sample. So let's say mystery sample. And assignment operator, we're going to combine some numbers. And these numbers are coming directly out of your text. Comma, 159358106405519538833. Okay. Let's look at the mean of our mystery sample. And again, we've got a mystery sample up here that comes up in our little um, environment with all our variables. Okay, so we now have a mean of 816,000. Um, so is this a sample of U.S. states? Is it something else? Um, just by itself, you, we can't really figure out what that is. So um, let's look at how we can compare this mystery sample to the sample means that we have before. 
Okay, so let's um, let's do a co let's do the quantile of the sample means. Let's do the probabilities of five and O oh, nine nine five. Whoops, there we go. Okay, so this it's only going to show that you know the the point five percent and it means that 0.5% of the sample means are lower than the 1,383, okay? So our mystery sample mean of 816,000, you know, it doesn't really fit into there because it is on that low, that low 5% side, okay? So what we can kind of guess from this is that this sample mean it's not a sample of states okay it's just this is way too small of a mean to be in with the sample of states because you're in that lower 0.5 percent okay so what this is actually showing is this is um going to be a number of people in five different territories okay including puerto rico caribbean guam you know things like that the territories are not considered states, okay? So they're different. So let's look at some additional information based on the states versus the territories. So let's look at the sampling distribution, which is an SD, okay? That's a new one that we haven't done before. Sample means, there we go. So, Remember, we we had the shape. Okay, let me do the shape. There's my shape. Okay, I do have that bell curve, but we're we you know we haven't really quantified what the the spread of the distribution is. So this is going to give you that standard deviation of your sampling distribution using you know what we have. So our standard deviation is going to be that. 2,992,506, okay? <sighs> luckily, unluckily, not sure. Statistics is not black and white, okay? So they're not gonna have clear labels. You know, there, there's certain things that we're not gonna be able to to kind of understand, um, you know, and, and we're not gonna be able to put hard labels on certain things. Now, there is a shortcut to finding a standard error. We what we can do is we can say SD oops SD parenthesis US state populations dollar sign April ten census. Okay. Divide by the square root of five. S Q R T. Right? S Q R T five. Okay. And then see what that gives us. Okay. The standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, okay, that's going to give you that, that standard error. Now, the last thing we can do is another shortcut, and what we can do is we can use the mean and the standard error for actual, like, cut points. So, let's say our standard error, let's save into that, and so assignment. The standard deviation of U.S. state pops, dollar sign, April, census, okay, plus two, oops, parenthesis, two, times, nope, divided by, the, divided by the square root. I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry about that. Okay, so now we've saved that standard error into um, a variable. Now what I want to do, I want to make a cut point um, at 97.5%, okay? Um, so I'm going to call it cut, that's not it, cut point 97.5, but I'm not doing the point. Assignment statement, mean U.S. state pops dollar sign April census. Okay, plus two times, this is where I got ahead of myself, sorry, the uh, standard error. Okay, 
Now, if I want to know what that cut point is, I can just type cut point and it's going to give me what that cut point is. Okay, notice that's a little different than what we calculated using that quantile up here. Um, you know, it, it's, it's because nothing is just black and white. There are several different ways to, uh, you know, figure out things and different ways to get to where you need to be. Um, they're all correct. They're all good. Um, so that's See, that wasn't so bad. So chapter 10, really, it's all about sampling and taking those samples and figuring out what a sample is and how to best use it. Now in chapter 11, we're going to talk about accessing outside data using R. So outside data were not stored locally on your hard drive, um, might be on the internet, might be in different data forms. There's a lot of information for this part, but it really, really boils down to how do I import that data? Most of the methods are similar. So we're going to go through several different methods and, methods and you will start to see a pattern. But we're going to recognize the different data sources that are available for analysis. We're going to use RStudio to import different types of data. Okay, we're going to use, um, we're going to build some R code to access that data. We're going to look at Excel. JSON and SQL databases. We're going to look at the SQL DF package. We're going to actually look at quite a few new packages that we're going to learn to install and activate um, using the R Studio. We're going to use the R S apply and T apply functions to do summary analysis on a data frame. We're going to look at loops using R. And then finally, we have a few new functions. And these new functions, though, really are particular to accessing that outside data. Um, so don't get, you know, all up in your head and, and don't get bogged down by all, the amount of functions that are there. Data can be broken up into many different forms, but it is typically divided into some major groupings. The first is, is it readable by a human? Okay, or not? Typically, the ones that are not saved um, in a human readable format is saved in a binary format, okay? Those binary formats, uh, it, in reality, are more efficient and faster than the ones readable by humans, okay? So that is a trade-off. The other way to, or the other um, division is that, is your data proprietary or is it an open format? And when I say format, I'm speaking of how the data is stored. So for example, data stored in an Excel spreadsheet, okay? An Excel spreadsheet is actually a Microsoft proprietary format. So we are gonna have some special commands to get into Excel because it's proprietary versus something that is the, like the, the JSON or which is more internet friendly and it's considered an open source format where everybody knows how to access that data. Okay, so there is some uh, JSON is more like a CSV, okay, where you have that uh, comma delimited um, file. The easiest and fastest way to import data into R is to use the data import dialog in RStudio. If you open up your RStudio, look at the upper right hand side um, in that environment window that I've got up here. You can look at the environment variable from up here. There is an import data set um, pull down. Okay. You need to make sure that in order to use this, you need to make sure that your read R, where it says read R, you need to make sure that package has a check mark by it in the package dialog box on that bottom right hand side. Okay. But you can, for a CSV, we're just going to look at importing a traditional CSV, which is what we've done before. We're gonna say from text, read R. That's what you're gonna to choose to read just a true CSV. From there, you're gonna import text data box and the box is actually much larger than this, but I just gave you the snippets of the pieces that you're gonna be concerned with. At the very top, it's gonna to ask you for a file or a URL and actually over here at the end, there is a browse window, a browse button. So you can browse to a position on your local hard drive or you can put in a URL like I did here. I had just put in there the URL that we've been using for that census data. The second place to look is at the very bottom of that import window. You've got import options, okay? You do need to give it a name 
or it will um, give you an error. The other thing you can do is first rows names. You can specify the delimiter, whether it be ca um, comma or tab. And I almost said cab, but that's okay. Um, and you can give it some additional information, but really the, the main one here that you need is to set the data set name. Now, once you do that, you can go ahead and click on the import button. And what you will see is that in the upper left where we had been typing our functions, you should get an additional tab right here that is showing all of your data in a spreadsheet type form, okay? Within your CSV file though, in order for this to work, your first row must be your header or you can unclick that box in the import um, options. The rest of the rows within the CSV have to be your data, okay? In the, and now again, we're talking in that CSV. Anything that's a text needs to be in double quotes. They need to be separated by commas because we chose comma delimited. And it has to be one line per row. Typically, this is what a CSV looks like. Um, so that really shouldn't be any um, trouble going forward. So that's just another way of importing data uh, rather than giving the URL string and doing those several comments that we did in that function um, from last time. Next, let's look at that Excel data, um, which is that proprietary information. So you can do it two different ways. You can do the same import we just did for CSV files because you saw Excel on the pull down, or you can read an Excel file directly into R. In order to do this, we're going to need a new package. Okay, it's called G data. Two ways to do this as well. If you look, it's not in your packages right now in your bottom right hand side. So you can either install it in that pane like we did last time using that install button, or you can install it using the command line. So if you want to use the command line, you say install packages and you put G data in quotes. Okay. And like they say here, there, it just, it scrolls. Okay. There's lots of stuff being updated. In order to activate it, you can either click the checkbox on the right hand side in that packages folder, or you can say library quote G data. This is going to be your Microsoft package. Okay. This is going to give you your database connections. You're going to have read and write, but this is what is giving you the support for your Excel files. Okay. This is what's going to give you that right software for the right version. So the biggest thing to remember going forward when you're accessing outside data is to make sure you have the proper package installed in R to read that data. Just as an FYI, the database section is for your toolbox only. Okay. There is a lot of information to access the database directly. Most of it we weren't going to be using in practice for right now, unless you do it for your project. That's up to you. As far as I know, looking through the labs and the assignments, we're not really going to have to need that database interaction. We're mostly going to be using um, what we've already talked about, the CSV, um, and the J we'll be looking at some JSON files, but that's about it. So just let this wash over you. Please don't get, um, there's a lot of information in just this database section. Okay. Database is considered an outside or remote system. And R does support sending SQL commands to the database in order to obtain data. There are a few packages out there to connect with databases. Again, you're going to see this as a recurring theme. You need the correct package to import the correct data. Okay. Um, the package that you need is going to depend on the type of database. Okay. So just like we needed to import specific packages for Excel versus the CSV, there are different types of databases out there and there are different packages to associate with each one of those types. So for example, there we've got, um, R my, my SQL, which we're going to look at a little bit more here because SQL, you can get a free version. Um, or there's or R Oracle, which is going to allow you to interact with an Oracle database. So we're going to use that R my SQL, but in order to do that, you're going to need an SQL database. You can go here to this link, which is also in your book. Um, and you can get a my SQL database for free on their online. Now, couple things to point out. Once you click on this, make sure you go to the community server um, section for the free version. And the second is if you are on a PC, 
The easiest way to install it is to make sure you download the MSI version. So make sure you look at that and don't download the zip. Okay, there's two different versions. There's a zip and an MSI. MSI, way easier. Um, so once my SQL is installed, now we have the database that we can connect to. But we need the information in R and the package in R to make that connection. Okay, so next you are going to need to look for that R MySQL package in that package listing in R Studio on that bottom right. If it's not there, install it. Uh, once it's installed, make sure it's activated. Okay, or you can use the install packages and the library commands. Now, once all of that is done, we can actually use it. So, the first thing we need to do is to connect R to the database. So we have something called DB Connect, which is Database Connect, and that is going to establish that connection between R and the database we want to use. Okay, the DB Driver function specifies what we want to use, which is a MySQL client. It's going to use the DB List Tables um, function to see what tables are there once we do that connection okay if you do this right off right after installing mysql you're going to get zero because there's no data there we haven't created a table yet so let's look at how we can create a table using r in mysql we're going to create a small table um, you can in order to do this you use the db write table database write table okay what you're going to send it it is going to, you're going to send it the connection. You're going to name it census. You want to send it the data, which here is going to be test frame. And yes, we want to overwrite any information that is there. Okay. Once this is done, if you go ahead and do that um, run DB list tables con um, function again, you're going to get the word census. Okay. So now it's going to give you the table name that you have this. Okay, I didn't put a picture of it here because it just, it literally spits out census. From that, now we can go and get data out of that database, okay? And what we do is we use DB get query, database get query. We send it the connection and then we send it the SQL format, okay? If you're not familiar with SQL, th these um, commands in all capitals are the SQL commands. The three basic commands in SQL are select, from and where okay so select after select you're going to give it a column name from needs a table name and where is going to give you any um, ways to filter and limit that data so if i say here select state name um, and the july 11th population from the census table where the july 11th population is less than blah okay it's going to give me those eight values back Okay, so you can see how we used that SQL. So let's compare using SQL and R. So there is a function called SQLDF, which is like SQL data frame. And that is going to allow you to use a data frame as a database. Okay, so it's gonna allow you to query a data frame as if it were a database. If you look over here, SQL data frame, select something from some, the table okay so select the average of the April 10 base from the test frame okay you can then do all kinds of commands on it okay we have another one here select state name from test frame where July population is less than blah okay so that is gonna allow remember test frame is your data frame so instead of saying from table we're saying from data frame there's another command, the t apply command. It does something very similar. It has three arguments in it. The function applied, so here's your, the vector subset, and the given factor variable, okay? Now, what this did, if you look at it, it grouped it by regions, okay? So if you do understand SQL, it is the same as the grouped by function in SQL. If you don't know SQL, don't worry about it. So we can store the region means now, okay? And we can rename them. So to create a column with the appropriate region meant for each state, we use the which command, okay? So which. 
then R is gonna determine the appropriate index of where which region frame it goes into, okay? Command can be repeated on all of the regions. So here region names equals northeast. If you don't know if it's a one, um, you know, we can index this and access this just as if we would any other vector or list. Using loops in R does add code um, instead of saving code, but you know, it does have Using loops adds codes in R instead of saving it as it does in other programming language, but looping does avoid having to cut and repeat code, okay? You specify the number of times you want to execute the loop and use the for keyword, okay? Inside these curly brackets, that's gonna be the block of code that it's going to repeat however many times you indicate. So here for the variable X, it's going to change as it goes through this for loop. It's going to increment by one each time it completes the loop. So when I use X here, that's what's going to change in this loop, okay? So if I look at this first line, it says four, which is the keyword, and then in parentheses, here's your variable that is keeping track of how many times you've gone through the loop. For X equals one to four, okay? So that's what that is going to to explain. So for the first time through, it's going to be one, two, three, four, and then it's going to stop. Okay. So the X variable is what is going to change value each time you go through that loop. Now we've talked a little bit about that JSON or JSON file data. It stands for JavaScript Object Notation. Okay. Um, it is frequently used for sharing up to the minute information out on the web, up to date. Um, we can use it to access Google Geocode API to get data to use in a JSON format. So a JSON file is structured, it is human readable, and it is language independent. Okay, as with the other data files, again, there's some packages that we are going to need to install. This is the one that we're going to need for our um, assignments and for our labs, okay, because we are going to be accessing some JSON files. Okay, so you need rcurl and rjsonio. Now, both of those were already in my package list in my RStudio. So all I had to do is click on the checkbox. If they're not there, install them and then click them. So I just had to activate them. Make sure you do activate them, otherwise it, you're, it's not gonna know your commands. So first, let's create a helper function for a URL. URLs can get ugly. Okay. So let's create a, um, a helper function. We're going to call it make geo URL. And for this, I'm assigning it a function and I want to send it an address. Okay. So the format in the Google geocode API is that you've got this long string in front of every single URL, and then it starts to change based upon the address that you want. Okay. So first we're going to initialize the URL to a root URL. So everything start, every address starts with this. Okay. So we're going to put that there first. Second, we're going to append to it the pieces that we need. Okay. J S O N question mark address equals the address that we sent to it. And then we're going to put more text. Okay. What is that gonna look like? Okay, oh, sorry, I missed a step. Then we're going to take this URL as a string and we're gonna convert it to a true URL. And by that, we're gonna use URL and code. And so that, what that's gonna send back is a true URL object. Now, okay, if I call this make geo URL and I say, give it 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Washington, DC, okay? Here is the URL string that it's gonna give back. There's that um, base of the geocode. Here's where it starts that second line of the URL, okay? The JSON question mark address equals 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, okay? Comma, Washington DC, comma, sensor equals false. 
Okay, so all we did is we just created something to help us out, and this is specific for Google Geocode, okay? Um, you don't need to know this much in depth as far as a helper function in the assignments. It's pretty straightforward where we're getting the data from. Okay, now that we created this little helper function, now we can look at accessing the data from the Google API. So we've created another function and what it's going to do is it is going to attain the latitude and longitude of a specific address. Okay, so this address to latitude lang function, ADDR address to latitude longitude, that's our function. Okay, um, we're going to use, we're going to capture the result in an object and that object is going to be this API result. Okay. So that make geocode URL address. That's what we just did in that helper. So this URL is going to be the URL um, that was created. We're going to send it and that's going to be stored in API result. Now from that, um, we're going to place that in a function from JSON. Okay. So here's my variable. We're assigning it from JSON API result, which is going to be the URL and then simplify equals false. Okay. This is going to give back a regular R data frame. Okay. One thing I want you to notice is down here, we have some things down here because it is the internet and it is not always as reliable as we would like it to be. We have a function called try. Okay. What that's going to do is it's going to do some error catching. Okay, if it encounters an error in either the latitude or the longitude here, okay, it's going to continue to run the code and it's not going to stop. Okay, now remember what is being sent here is going to be a lists, not vectors. So you're going to have to use the double brackets here and here. Okay, what you're returning is you're concatenating the latitude and the longitude together. Okay, so hopefully that can kind of show you your, so the big things here is you, the, the from JSON, the get URL is exactly what we did before, but now we've got this, this section right here that's new. Okay, and then how to access that data. Lastly, your book has got some great examples on additional JSON data available to you. Okay, it might be really great for you to read through, especially with the, um, the assignment and the lab. It goes through a huge data set of New York City bikes, okay? The nice thing is, is that no matter what the size of the data set, the steps are gonna be exactly the same, okay? So I didn't wanna go through this again um, and be redundant, but please take a look at that uh, towards the end of chapter 11 in your book. Um, it goes through the exact same steps. You're gonna use that those two packages, okay? We're gonna make the URL, um, we're gonna, when and um, station from the result object, convert it to a data frame, we're gonna rename it, okay? So you can see all these steps are the same no matter what the size of your data set is. That is all there is, I know that's a lot. So let me go into what you guys are gonna be owing me. So assignment four and lab four, that's all practicing the chapter 10 sampling. I don't foresee you guys having any issue with that. Um, it really is just, um, taking um, those samples and doing some repeats. Assignment five and lab five, those are the two that are going into that chapter 11 data accessing, okay? Assignment five, you're gonna be accessing a, a JSON file, you're gonna clean the data, access some of it using the basic SQL and that T apply functions, okay? The nice thing about the, the assignment is it kind of walks you through it a little bit better. Lab five is gonna be some basic SQL commands and into an air quality data set, okay? Um, so we're not using that JSON for the lab, just the assignment. Again, the installation of that MySQL, it's up to you, it's not required. Um, it's just if you wanna play or if you want to kind of get a little bit more familiar with uh, working and integrating with a database itself. Um, as always, any questions? feel free to email me. I'm available to you. Please take a second and fill out the survey that you guys have available in the My Carolina U. That's really important to those above me. Um, and I guess it's important to me too. Um, so as always, 
again, if you need me, I'm here for you. Happy coding.